Our advocate show, The Truth Will Get You Crucified. That will be the topic of today's show and others. Going to be talking a little bit of uh, the, uh, the type, the style of deception that is being perpetrated by, or is it perpetrated, by one Jordan B. Peterson, who I still recommend you pick up his book. I think it's 30 bucks. Let me talk a little bit about that. And just as kind of a warning, uh, I'm a little bit fired up right now. And uh, so there is a, I would say there's about a, a 70% chance that there's going to be some bombs being dropped, uh, word bombs, with a word uh, that starts with a letter that if you were to spell out the sound of that letter, it would be E-P-H. And therefore, uh, I know sometimes uh, you guys have your kids listen. Uh, not this one. Well, uh, listen to the whole thing first. I cannot, uh, I cannot guarantee that there's going to be those words in this podcast. But uh, you know, you know, uh, past performance is not indicative of future results. That that sort of thing. Disclaimer. 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 Um, all markets bear risk. Blah blah blah. You know, enter it. You listen to it first before you let your kids listen to it. I guess is basically what I'm, what I'm trying to say. I'm fired up. And you, some of you might notice that there's a little tippy-tappy going on on the roof. That's rain. And it stopped raining. And hopefully it will stop long enough that I can get this podcast recorded. But first, I'm going to read your daily devotional to you. It's all right to be human. When your mind wanders while you are praying or reading your Bible, don't be surprised or upset. Just simply return your attention to me. Share a secret smile with me, knowing that I understand. All right? Just look up to God and just be like, ah, I did it again. <laughs> Rejoice in my love for you, which has no limits or conditions. Whisper my name in loving contentment, assured that I will never leave you or forsake you. Intersperse these peaceful interludes abundantly throughout your day. This practice will enable you to attend, uh, I'm sorry, attain. Let's start over. Intersperse these peaceful interludes abundantly through your day. This practice will enable you to attain a quiet and gentle spirit which is pleasing to me. As you live in close contact with me, the light of my presence filters through you, uh, filters through you to bless others. As you live in close contact with me, the light of my presence filters through you to bless others. Your weakness and woundedness are the openings through which the light of the knowledge of my glory shines forth. My strength and power show themselves most effective in your weakness. That is today's devotion for January 23rd from a devotional book called Jesus Calling. Jesus Calling. It's written in the first person, so it's as if Jesus is speaking those words himself. This was written by a, a longtime missionary named Sarah Young. I recommend that you pick it up, and if you don't want to do this one, my utmost for his highest. It's easily the most popular devotional book in the world. Oswald Chambers, my utmost for his highest says that he wrote it, but he did not. His wife did. Uh, anyways, why do I have so many of these facts in my head? Did you know that polar bears don't actually have uh, hair follicles? They don't. They have hair cuticle, like fingernails. That's what their hair is made out of, cuticle. Why do I know that? I, dude, I literally, literally, I could prob, well, not literally. I could literally probably rattle off useless facts nonstop for probably three hours. I think. I wonder if there's some sort of Guinness Book of World Records for rattling off useless facts. Useless facts. Facts. And facts and truth are different. Very different. Facts, truth, honesty, uh, all spelled very differently and therefore they all have very different meanings. Truth will get you crucified. It's supposed to. It's supposed to work that way. 
Truth is spelled with a capital T, by the way. Truth is a man. God man. Jesus Christ. He was crucified. He was the truth. The truth will get you crucified. Case in point. Give you an just give you an idea. Give you an idea, right? Let's say that you live in an area that is mostly uh, liberal, right? Let's say you work. I mean, it could be anywhere. You know, Todd Milligan lives in Oklahoma. We got listeners in Colorado, right? We got listeners in Wyoming. We got listeners all over the place, and it, it doesn't really matter. Like some, it's it really comes down to San Diego, where I'm from. When I was growing up, very conservative. Everyone was a Republican because pretty much everybody uh, was blue collar or owned a business. You know, very Republican. Not as much anymore, but still, you know, San Diego is still very much a Republican town. But you go north, you know, a little bit. I mean, Los Angeles used to be pretty Republican too, but you know, you get up in other places, very Democrat, very much, very liberal. Uh, but let's pretend that you lived in an area of, of whatever state you live in and, and that that area was very liberal and you worked in a place where everybody was like, oh my God, it's a woman's right to abort her baby. It's a woman's sovereign right. It's her body, it's her choice, right? And you go, well, uh, wait a minute, I listened to this podcast and one of the listeners who were all, you know, I listened to a podcast where we're all friends one of my friends on that podcast, like, he had a baby uh, that was only in the womb for 22 weeks. A full-term pregnancy is 40 weeks. This baby was barely, just a smidge over the halfway point. And because of some uh, unforeseen medical emergency, that baby had to be removed from its home. It's home that it still had a whole another 18 weeks to live in so that it could properly form. And that baby was removed from the womb, you know, put into an incubator, hooked up to all kinds of machines, I'm sure. I, I mean, I don't actually know the, the details. It was Derek, right? I don't know all the details, but I'm sure it wasn't easy. And that baby is now strong, and healthy, and smart, and beautiful 22 weeks and you might live in a you might work in a place where everybody that you know everybody that you spend eight to ten hours a day with everybody that you spend the majority of your life with right every day is like a hockey game there's three periods and each period is eight hours long one of those periods is done is is done sleeping you do that one period sleeping now you have two periods left one of those periods, you're at work. And in the other period, that last little eight hour period, you're driving to and from work and doing your chores, like going to the grocery store, going to the post office, doing what you gotta do, going by that home depot, right? Whatever it is you gotta do, like that last eight hours, that is not exclusive to your family. It's your family time and all the other stuff you gotta do. Eight hours at least is at work, and eight hours at least, well, eight hours is sleeping. You have three periods of your life, and the majority of the time that you spend with anybody is with your coworkers. Let's just say you're surrounded by people that are like, oh my God, Barack Obama was the best president ever. Shout your abortion. Everybody's a racist. If, you, if you're white and a man, you're a racist. Well, let's say that that's the environment that you work in, right? If you stand up and say, no, abortion is murder. Do you know what goes on during an abortion? What happens is, is a woman uh, hires or authorizes a physician to go up into her lady parts with uh, a wrench and a knife, right? The, the clamps, right? What, I mean, it's, I guess, uh, what, what, what would you call that? Not a wrench, but something else. What are the clamps? Whatever. And grab that baby by its leg and tear that leg off. And then the next leg and then the arms, and then the head. And, and 
Uh, New York is just about to make it, according to the news today, New York is just about to make it so that a woman can choose to do that at any point during those 40 weeks. That's murder. That's murder. Because we know that at least at 22 weeks, that that is a living soul. Because we can now see that particular living soul because one of our friends is her father. Hey, and then they can say, well, I guess that's, well, I guess I can see your point there. But still, I mean, uh, what about week one? It's like, well, then, then the discussion becomes at which point do we judge and say, well, this is where life begins. And then you get into some very relativistic territory. Well, maybe when the heart beats. Well, maybe when there's a nervous system. Maybe when there's any sign of, you know what I mean? It's like, well, you can. You know, I can argue that from the moment of conception, and I can argue it with science, with biology, like I can argue that point. And it, but it, it doesn't matter. Facts don't matter, people. They don't matter to those people. You could you can say to them, "What about Derek's daughter?" Listen, I'm sorry if if it's not Derek. I'm sorry, but you know what I mean. Well, what about this? They don't care. Facts do not get in the, the way of their uh, need to feel, feel virtuous. They don't care about the facts. There's no point in even arguing. They don't care. And if you were in that environment and you stood up and said, nope, that's murder, it's gross, it's satanic, and what's worse is it, it, it's even more vile and evil and satanic, like actual... Like Prince of Darkness, Fallen Angel Lucifer, otherwise known as Hazatan, which is where we get the word Satan, which means your enemy, your adversary, the one who hates you, the one who's trying to destroy you, the destroyer, the the uh, the lion who is uh, roaming about seeking whom he may devour. That's who's in charge of that. Because it goes all the way up to the top of the government where it's like the government has now made it so that you, good Christian you, are paying for it with your money. You and I, with our tax dollars, pay for the dismembering of the most vulnerable and the only ones of our citizens who can actually claim innocence. I can't claim innocence. I've done some wild stuff in my life. I know you have too. There's only one class of citizen that can claim innocence. And that's infants. And you and I are paying for the dismemberment of it, the innocent little infants. That's some, that is some vile, creepy, you can smell the sulfur. You know? How is it that we've allowed ourselves to get this point? It's crazy, but... The truth, if you stand up and say the truth, you will be fired. You will be fired. And those co-workers of your, yours, if you have Facebook, Twitter, uh, have any sort of ties to the community, they will attack you by going to the members of whatever communities that you belong to and slandering your name. This guy hates women. He's a bigot. He, they will crucify you. It should happen. <clears throat> it happens so automatically that the fact that it happens that way tells you this is right. This is how it is, in fact, supposed to work. <clears throat> you should be crucified. You speak the truth. Crucifixion is the result. It is the result. Now, before I go any further, I want to give you a Bible story. F you, atheist. I'm going to give you a Bible story. And uh, this, I'm hoping that I can tie this in, but if you go through the Gospels, you, you learn that there were 12 disciples until there were 11. And then once there was 11, they voted, uh, you know, the other 11, they voted in uh, a new guy, right? And they picked, you know, they picked this other guy and then there were 12 again, right? And then later on... Uh, uh, Saul of Tarsus, who was a famous uh, Christian murderer, met Jesus and converted and spent the rest of his life praising Jesus. And that's where we get most of the books in the New Testament. 
uh, all of those people, <clears throat> all of them, all of those disciples uh, were tortured to death. Uh, even uh, even things that we uh, like, you know, Paul died in prison, and you could say, well, he wasn't really tortured to death. It's like, no, listen. You have to look, you can go onto YouTube, you can look at the actual cell or the style of cell that Paul would have been uh, kept in. It was just a hole in the, that had been dug in the ground, maybe, I don't know, eight, ten feet deep or six feet deep or whatever. And, you know, maybe just enough room to extend your arms out to the elbows, but not to the fingers. You know what I mean? Like if you lift up your arms and point your elbow elbows east and west, that's about how much room Paul had. And he spent years and years and years with that much room. Not seeing anybody except for the guards, whatever, not having conversations with people. You know what I mean? Like it was torture. And that's how he died. And all of the disciples... You know, uh, St. Peter, if you're Catholic, you know, Peter, uh, he was crucified and then he requested that he be crucified upside down so that, you know, so that he would not be, you know, he was saying, I'm not, I'm not good enough to be crucified right side up. Very odd request, but you know, you can think about that for a while. And all of them, they were all uh, tortured to death and killed for their beliefs. All except one, John the Beloved. Now, why is that? How is that possible? Well, there's one way to look at it. There's, o there's really only one thing that all the disciples had in common that, that John the Beloved did not have in common with them. When Jesus would, was arrested, they all betrayed Jesus. They ran like cockroaches with the lights turned on. And for good reason. For good reason. Right? I'm not, I'm not crapping on the disciples. They had a very good reason to do what they did. Because nobody wants to get crucified. Like that was a horrible, like if they were, if they were caught, it was almost guaranteed that they would also be crucified for being business partners if you will you know what i mean like in the club in this new jesus club uh, that had formed every single one of them scattered they be they all betrayed jesus to a degree that is uh, in my opinion equal to uh well not really to a lesser degree than judas but still pretty severe it's like, dude, this is your boy. This is your friend. You've been friends with him for three years. You spent every single day, every waking moment with this guy. And now that the now that the heat's turned on you, you're gonna run like a bunch of little, you know, B words. You know, scatter like cockroaches. They all scattered except for one. The same. Uh, John the Beloved, who wrote. Uh, uh, the Gospel of John. He also wrote, uh, you know, First John and Second John and Third John. He also wrote the Book of Revelation, uh, which is also it. it um, he didn't call it Revelation. He called it the Unveiling, um, or the Apocalypse, is the, the way you know the, uh, the the Revelation. And that's what the word Apocalypse means. It means the Revelation. And John wrote that, you know. John the Beloved wrote that book on the island of Patmos in his, when he was very old. And even though he was in exile, it's like, yeah, but, you know, he was on, you know, a really pretty island in, in the Mediterranean. I mean, it was bad, but it wasn't, it wasn't that bad. You know, I could handle that. Most of you could handle that. Like, once you figure out food and water, everything else is fine. What's the difference with him? What is the difference with John? Well, he... He went to the cross. He beheld the crucifixion. His friend, his, his beloved friend was being murdered, tortured to death. He was going to be there for him. He was going to soak in the horrors of what was happening. He was the only one 
of the 12 that witnessed it. And he was the only one who died of natural causes. Now what can we glean from that? We can glean that one way or another, you're going to come to the cross. One way or another, you will come to the cross. It's either going to be by an act of will or it will be by force. But you're going to come to the cross. You're going to see it. Whoever you, I don't care if you're Joe Rogan, Sam Harris, one way or another, you're going to see it. And, and if you're not willing, you know what I mean? If you don't do it willingly, we. You know, if you throw Jesus under the bus in an attempt to not have to face the truth, the truth. The truth will get you crucified. And speaking the truth is wildly unpopular. And it will get you, it's, it's, you know, you stand up and you say, wait a minute, these, these two 10 year old boys that are, that are being found in strip clubs and receiving money in a, in a gay strip club or this other one who's was highlighted in a picture with another grown man with his genitals out in the picture and you stand up and you say that is not only child abuse that is a sexual attack on an innocent you will be you will be crucified as well you should be because that's what the truth should produce it, it should produce Jesus said it he said man you guys think they were hard on me <laughs> you know or wait a minute no, no I'm sorry Jesus said to his disciples he said hey man if you think they're being hard on you just remember they came at me first I went through it I endured it so you're all out of excuses they're going to be hard on you. You can expect that. You should expect it. You should expect it. And these are weird times because, the t see, the tendency is um, to look at these people and be like, well, if we could just give them, you know, data. Data? Data. If we just give them data, they will, you know, they have a brain. There's a, there's a functioning brain inside their skull cap. Reason should kick in at some point. At some point. Like I said earlier, it's like you can show them actual video of what actually happens during an abortion. And you can bring up like there are many, many, many babies that are, that are born every year, every year in and out. At 22 weeks, I'm sure there's probably ones that are born less, and they're fine. They live normal lives. Healthy, strong, beautiful lives. You can bring that to them. It's like, this is a fact. It's not disputable. This is not, a, this is not, you cannot argue this point. It's right here. Here's the fact. And it won't do any good. Isn't that weird? Isn't that weird? That you can bring just just basic, like, uh, this is something everybody knows. Here it is. Here's the fact. Nothing. You can bring up the facts, you know, you, you, you present them with facts like, you know, when they talk about, like, we need to have, I was just watching Flecka's talks yesterday. And there's this lady, and she's like, or no, it was, a, it was a guy. And he was like, dude, we need to have more, you know, uh, women, people of color in, you know, higher positions like government positions and, you know, higher positions in office and whatever. And you can be like, whoa, 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 hold on a second. Hold on, hold on. Shouldn't we have whoever the best person for the job is? And not just say like, oh, well, you're black and female. Therefore, you get to run General Electric. Right? You can bring up the facts and I'm like, whoa, 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 so let's say, for example, that you have to have your heart transplanted. 
right? You go in, doctor says, your ticker's no good. We gotta get rid of that. It's a piece of garbage. We gotta put something else in there. Maybe one of those Jarvik's hearts, maybe a baboon heart, who knows, right? And your surgeon comes in and they say, listen, we got this surgeon for you. And this is gonna be really good for your reputation because this doctor is a, um, a black transvestite, a black transgendered LGBTQ LMNOP, right? So this person was born a man, identifies as a woman, wears a dress, and they're black. And uh, let's see, what else? What other victim you know, group can we, can we put in there? Who knows? They say, this is, this is really going to help you. You're, after this is over, if you're still alive, because, you know, you can die from a heart transplant very easily, very easily. Like, if you're alive, you will be able to tell all of your friends that a black transgender person saved your life. And you would think, like, well, okay, all right, like, I'm, I'm with you so far, but can this person do the job? Like, did this person graduate medical school? And they say, well, of course. I mean, obviously, they have a medical license. They've obviously graduated medical school. And you say, oh, okay, fair enough. Now, how many heart transplant doctors are there in the United States? And they say, well, there are 10,000. It's probably less. Let's just say it's 5,000. There's 5,000 people in America that can perform this particular surgery. And you say, okay. Now, as far as the list of, you know, uh, who has more success and who has more failure on a, on a scale of zero to 5,000, or sorry, one to 5,000, one being the best, 5,000 being the worst, right? The number one guy has the least amount of fatalities and the highest success rate of the other 5,000 people. Where does this black transgender person appear on this list and they say oh well it's it's actually number 5000 funny that you should ask that particular question because this person is actually number 5000 they can do the job they have the uh, education the training the ability but as far as people dying underneath their knife this person is the worst at this but you shouldn't pay attention to that because the real thing that's important here is you're going to be able to tell all your friends that this poor victim, this person that, that belongs in some horrific victim group, performed the surgery, if you're still alive. And you would think like, you know, so you ask your liberal friend like, okay, what in that case are you telling me that your need to feel virtue is greater than your need to be alive. And that you wouldn't look across that table and say, you know what? Um, I think I'm going to go get a, a second, maybe even a third opinion. And you run your arse over to the competitions hospital, right? You run from, you run from uh, Kaiser Permanente where you're at and you run over to uh, what's some other big uh, conglomerate? You run over there because it's like, listen, number 5,000 is over here. So if you have number 4,999, I'm in. If you have anything better than that, you know what I mean? Because I, I, by getting any other, anybody else, I am increasing my actual odds of surviving this, this horribly traumatic surgery. I have uh, a bunch of screws in my knee, right? 12 screws. I have 12 screws and an 8 inch plate. Is it 12 screws or was it 14? I want, and it's 12. Right? I shattered my knee into, oh, this was 14 different pieces, so uh, 12 screws. My, my knee is shattered. And the, uh, the, the type of person that does that kind of surgery is called an uh, orthopedic surgeon is what I want to say. And there are like 10,000 of those in America. Right? <laughs> there's a lot of them. Maybe not 10,000, but there's a lot of them. The lady that performed my surgery is Jewish. It's a 
Jewish lady, right? But uh, that doesn't matter to me. What does matter to me is that uh, on many occasions she has been listed in the top 100 uh, you know, scientists, surgeons in the United States. She's, the top, she's in the top 100. There's 50 states. Do the math, it's two uh, per state, <laughs> like senators. There's two per state. I got one of them that day. I got real lucky, real lucky. I got one of, you know, I got one of the top 100 people in the United States. That's all I care about. I don't care that she's a woman. I don't care that she's Jewish. I wouldn't care if she was black. I wouldn't care if she was black and transgendered. I wouldn't care about that. What I would care about is like, oh, okay, so you're top 100 at doing this. Fantastic. He might be the love child of, of Milo Yiannopoulos and Brandon Straka and black and wearing a dress. Wouldn't I don't care. I don't care. How good are you at doing this job? And you talk to your liberal friends and you say, so in that case, what do you say? Guess what they'll say? They will lie in your face. They will say, no, I will, I will take the, the 5,000th worst heart surgeon because I don't, I, you know, I'm not a racist. It's like, no, you're lying. You, you fear power more than you fear the truth. You're more afraid of power than you are the truth. I'm afraid of the truth. The truth is very rarely kind. It's gentle, but not kind. You know? It's a heck of a thing for God to come to you and say, you know what your problem is? You don't believe. Because I've heard those words from the Almighty. Not with like, you know, again, it's, it's a different sounding voice. Your eardrums don't perceive it. It's a different kind of voice. And I've heard those words and it's hard. It's violent. And it's peaceful. Anything God says to you when it's the truth, like it may be harsh and it may make you fall on your face and cry like a little baby. But at the same time, it is oddly comforting because there's this thing where it's like, yeah, your problem is you don't believe and uh, I'm here to fix that. Don't worry. Like I, I have belief for you. I want you to believe and I'm aware of your... Uh, Malady, is that the right word? I know what's broken in you and I'm going to fix it. So, I mean, my point is, is like when you're, when you're, you, you look around and you think like in the case of the Covington High School kids, here's these kids. And at first we're all told that these are evil racist people. They're Catholics and they're white and they're male and they're blah, blah, blah. I fell for it too. I went and so I was like, oh, these guys are bad. Because I only saw the little three minute clip or, you know, whatever. And then it turns out there was 45 minutes of, of video. And then it turned out that there was two hours of video. I didn't watch the two hour one. I, I watched the edited version where it kind of skips you through it. And I realized like, oh, okay. The truth here is these kids were doing precisely what they should have been doing. This Indian guy is, a, is not only an asshole, but he's a liar. And someone who has uh, committed the sin, perhaps not the crime, but certainly the sin of stolen valor. And he served in the United States Marine Corps. He was probably a pencil pusher. But you know what I mean? Like, the, like the, the truth comes out and it's like, oh, well, thank God there's truth. You know, now I, now I can adjust my mind because I have new data. I have new data in my mind. And so I can adjust my point of view. Thank you very much, facts and truth. Because the truth, right, those were the facts, but the truth of it is the evil at work. You can see the evil at work. That's, what, that's where you start separating yourself from facts and moving over into truth. You're like, oh, this isn't just some factually abhorrent thing. This is evil. The media 
and Hollywood movie star or ex movie stars, people who aren't really famous anymore, they started saying things that put these innocent boys' lives in danger. Those boys' lives are being threatened right now, and they will be threatened probably for a good section of the next, I would say, 12 to 15 years of their lives. Those boys are not safe. Uh, I mean, I, I pray the Lord's protection over them. Certainly. I pray the Lord protect those boys in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, let the shed blood of the living God cover those boys and protect those boys. But the fact is, is that God's protection works in a lot of different ways. Sometimes God's protection works out just the way, the, the same way it worked out for Dietrich Bonhoeffer and St. Peter. Sometimes God's protection comes in the form of St. Peter being crucified upside down. You say, well, that doesn't sound like protection at all. Well, not at first glance. I understand that. But we're living in a time where, where even when the, the facts come out, all the facts came out, and these people, they just doubled down. They said, no, we've decided that these, these, these teenagers, they're barely even men. They just became men recently, like in the last couple of years. They're young men. These men deserve to die because they're white and they appreciate Donald Trump as president. They should die. Even though we've seen all the facts and we can see that these were good boys doing what they're supposed to be doing and some, some uh, murderous black men some very racist black men were attacking them and this slithering, slimy, piece of shit Indian guy decides that he's going to get it. He's going to capitalize on what's going on. He's going to go over there and he's just going to bang his little hippie drum, his little burning man hippie drum in the faces of these boys. And this one boy was just like, he said it. Oh, by the way, his Twitter, his Twitter was, was banned or suspended or whatever by Twitter. Just FYI. This one boy, he said, like, I didn't know what to do, so I just started praying. And I felt very uncomfortable, and that's why I was smiling like that. I was just, I was very nervous. I didn't know what was going on. I don't know what's going on. Think about that. Like, you're, you're just standing there. You've got these black guys that are screaming for your death. Calling your mother a whore. Just vile. Like, you can go and listen to the audio. It's nuts what these, what these grown men were saying to these young boys. Nuts. And they're just standing there like, hey, dude, uh, we're just standing here on the steps. Like, you guys just stay over there and say whatever you want. They were nervous already. These black men, men of fighting age, were taunting and threatening these young Christian boys, some of whom were also black. Don't you know? Don't don't let the irony be lost. They're nervous. They're like we're on the Lincoln Memorial steps or whatever it was that they were on, we're just minding our own business. We got these people breathing horrific curses at us, like like Goliath cursing Israel. So we just decided we're just going to mind our own business. And then all of a sudden, this dude comes out of nowhere banging a drum and walks right into our crowd. So you're already nervous and you're already a kid who doesn't know anything. No, and I wouldn't know what to do when that's... I'd be like, I, I don't know what to do here. Like, we're in the middle of Washington, D.C., you know what I mean? We're, we're, we're in public land. Technically, nobody's touched me, so I can't start throwing haymakers. I don't know what to do. 
And now I got this guy in my face, you know, there, there would be some nervous energy where it's just like, yeah, I'm just going to smile here. I'm just going to look at this guy in his eyes. And I'm just going to pray. And because of that, and it's clear that we can see that that is exactly what happened. What I just described to you, go see it for yourself. Their facts are easily obtainable, very easy. And you bring that to the leftists and you say, no, the white boy was right. The Indian guy was wrong. You don't have to get into any of that stuff about, yeah, these people never invented the wheel. You, know, like, you don't have to get into any of that stuff. You don't have to get into any of the facts like, oh, this guy's probably going to go back to his to his uh, his reservation and pick up a ten thousand dollar monthly check because his 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 tribe has been ransacked by casino money. Which, by the way, by there is no disputing, the casino money has ruined those people. It's ruined them. You think it was bad when they were just poor and alcoholics? It's a thousand times worse now. Now that they have unlimited, unearned money. You don't have to bring any of that up. You don't even have to bring any of that stuff up. All you have to do is say the white kid was right. The Indian guy and those black dudes were wrong and evil. And it turns out the, black, the Indian dude is a liar. A habitual liar who has been disowned by the uh, Lakota tribe. Right, the Lakota, I think it was Lakotas. They came out and they're like, listen, we know this guy. He's a liar. We don't like him. He does not represent us. He, 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 you don't even have to bring that up either. But when you go to your workplace, your theoretical workplace where everybody's a liberal and you say, nope, the white guy, I saw the whole video. White guy is correct. Black guys, Indian guy, not just wrong, but evil. You will be crucified. And, you, and facts will be useless. They will be useless. Now, I'll, give you, I'll give you a perfect example. We all have liberal friends. Well, probably. I do. I, you know, I got friends that are bedwetting liberals. Facts don't work on them. It's like, okay, so, uh, so you don't see anything wrong with the fact that Al Gore is now counted in the billionaire class He's no longer a multimillionaire. He's a billionaire. And the way that he got his billion dollars was by running around and telling everybody that the sky is falling. Global warming is going to kill us by the year 2014, everybody. You mark my words. The polar ice caps are going to melt by the year 2014. He's a billionaire and he is the first of his kind. He is the world's first green billionaire or eco-billionaire, whatever it is that you want to call it. He is the first of his kind. You bring that up to liberals and they say, I don't understand what this has to do with anything. Uh, 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 okay, okay. So the fact that he has several homes and he consumes like a hundred times more electricity than, than an Ameri any other average American, which has proven, it's been proven, like we've seen his electric bills they'll just look at you like I don't understand what this has to do with anything huh uh, uh, okay so flying around on pri private jets to, to preach the gospel of the sky is falling what does that have to do crazy Trump supporter are you some sort of science denier uh, Leonardo DiCaprio flying around the world on his private jet with his many many mansions using up all the electricity you don't see anything wrong with those two facts. The fact that he preaches the gospel of the sky is falling and that he flies private, owns several homes and burns through electricity like a, I don't know, like a thing that burns through a thing a lot. Nothing. You got nothing to say to that. Okay. Um, have scientists ever lied for money in the past? Was there a panel of scientists not long ago, just before I was born, like in my parents' age? One of my parents is still alive, very much alive, alive and is still employed. Well, she's self-employed, but you know, alive and still working, still sharp, still vital, all that stuff, very much alive. 
in her lifetime, there was a huge panel of scientists that told the American people that cigarette smoking is good for you. It's good for you, Johnny. Good for that old cardiovascular system. Don't question me. What are you, some sort of science denier? I am a scientist. You are but a, a, a surf, a, a, a pawn. How dare you? Has that ever happened before? Oh, that's just one example. Oh, no, no, no. No, I can do that actually for three hours as well. Example after example after example. When money is involved, it changes everything. These scientists that are going around saying, oh, the, the, the global warming and the, the carbon, man, you got to understand, man, the carbon is deadly, man. There's so much more carbon in the world now than there was 300,000 years ago. You don't understand, man. It's like, okay, okay. I'm sure there's more carbon in the world today than there was 300,000 years ago. But uh, if you were to say something to the contrary of that narrative, would you cease to get your government grant money? of which you use to pay your mortgage and feed your children. Pay for your vacations and pay for your automobile. Is there money tied to your opinion? Was there money tied to the opinions of those scientists who said that cigarette smoking was good for you? Was there money involved? Yes, there was. Do you think that if that money was not present, that they would have said that. I don't know. Don't you? The facts don't work. The facts don't work. That's the whole point. Truth. You have to live in the truth. And if you're afraid of being crucified, go listen to Sam Harris's podcast. Go be one of them. Get out of here. Christianity isn't for you, bro. You're afraid of coming to the cross? Then Christianity ain't for you. Go away. There are only a few who will find the way that leads to life. Jesus Christ said that. You don't... Statistically, you weren't going to make it anyways. Go away. Why would you stick around here? So this has got to be torture for you. Go away. Go listen to Sam Harris. Go listen to Jordan B. Peterson. Go listen to Jordan B. Peterson as he, as he distorts the truth just a little. You know, when, a, when an airplane flies a, across an ocean, right? you take off from LAX and you fly to Sydney, there's thousands of course corrections that are, that are made during that time. Because there's wind and there's, you know, uh, vapors and there's all kinds of stuff that is involved. Like, you, it's, it's a constant, like, you start thinking like, oh, man, those pilots have an easy job. All they got to do is take off. And then once they've taken off, they just got to sit around for however many hours and then they got to land. And that's it. It's like, oh, no, 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 no. They are constantly correcting the course. Because if they're off course by an inch, by an inch <laughs> in Los Angeles... They're not going to end up in Australia because by the time they've, they've flown for 14 and a half hours, they're going to end up in, uh, in uh, Russia. You know, the, the, uh, they're going to end up in Siberia. An inch from Los Angeles is thousands of miles by the time you've flown for 14 and a half hours. Course corrections. Just takes a little bit. And here's Jordan B. Peterson. He's not out there just telling filthy, blatant, like, whatever lies, whatever deceptions. He's not going all in. He's just twisting it just a little, just an inch. Oh, well, the Bible's full of great metaphors. And I really had an awakening to, to like, the truth of that last Saturday when I was reading to those kids. Because I was pointing out, you know, that the lady, the other lady, who's she's a cool lady, but... I was telling the kids, like, look, do you, you know, either everything in this truth, in this book that we read is true, 
or it's a lie. And only one of those two, it, it is a binary thing. It, you can't say like, well, I believe that there was such a guy as King David, but I don't believe that he killed a lion with his bare hands. It's like, look, no, 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 no. If there's one lie in that book, then it's all a lie. If Joshua did not tell the sun to stand still, and then an event happened that caused another however many hours of sunlight after that, if that did not happen, then the whole thing is nonsense. And her response to that was, well, what if it's just a metaphor? Ah, what if it's just a metaphor? King David didn't actually slay a giant. The thing is, it's a metaphor, you know? Like, sometimes, you know, things in life, they're bigger than you, and it's intimidating, and they breathe curses over you, and you just got to stand up there and fight. It's a metaphor, man, don't you know? The problem with that is that then you lose. Everything's a metaphor. I could use Tom Brady winning to advance to the Super Bowl as a wonderful metaphor for many different things in life. And it happened. And Tom Brady will be playing in the Super Bowl on February 3rd or whatever it is. Both things are true. Tom Brady actually did, and the Patriots, they actually did win that game to advance to the Super Bowl. That did happen. And you can use it as a metaphor. It bo both things are, both things can be true. Yes, David versus Goliath is a metaphor. And it actually happened. Right? You can use that as like, that's the, because that's how God works. Everything that actually happens can be used as a metaphor for growth. That's the importance of stories, is that it's for you to make your life easier and better, well, maybe not easier, but better, to make you help you to get through it as a stronger man. And here's Jordan B. Peterson, who's like, oh, no, the whole thing's a metaphor. You got to understand, man, this is just like Pinocchio. Do you think Pinocchio actually happened? No. But it's a great story, isn't it? I mean, you just got to save your father from the belly of the whale. You know, if you keep, if you keep telling lies, you're just going to turn into a jackass. Eeyaw, eeyaw. That's a metaphor, man. Don't you get it? It's like, yeah, I totally get it. It's a beautiful metaphor. Well, are you saying you believe that there was a little wooden boy? No, that's obviously not true. Do you see the deception there? That's why Jordan B. Peterson is always equating the holy text of the Christian and the Jew to Pinocchio. And all these other, like, st wonderful stories. Wonderful stories. Listen... Whoever wrote Pinocchio, you know, all the writings of Hans Christian Andersen, all the, all the writings of the, of, uh, the Brothers Grimm, like, it, it's all wonderful and masterful. Shakespeare, it's all wonderful. It's all wonderful and should be used for teaching. Right? But then when somebody comes along and says, hey, man, there were these, uh, you, you know, like in the, the Gladiator movie, Joey, do you like Gladiator movies? You know, when you watch Gla uh, uh, 300 with, uh, what's his name? Gerard Butler. Great guy, by the way. You watch that movie and it's like, oh, this is a brilliant metaphor. It's like, no, it actually happened. It didn't happen that way exactly, but that actually happened. It was a true story. If you watch Schindler's List and think, man, that's a really good metaphor, man, for, you know, beware of guys showing up wearing Hugo Boss and hating Jews. It's like, no, it's not a metaphor. It actually happened. I mean, it is a metaphor, but it actually happened. And if you, if you fail to, to, to uh, continue to understand that it actually happened, then you're moving us all closer to it actually happening again. And this deception of Jordan B. Peterson, it's like, that's, you know, truth. This is why truth matters. Because it takes just, you just have to throw somebody off course by an inch. Because they are going to travel for the rest of their lives. You throw them off by an inch. A day later, instead of showing up in Sydney, Australia, they're showing up in, in Calcutta, India. 
how did I get here? Well, you, you, you flew thousands of miles out of your way. It's like, no, I didn't. Well, I mean, from your perspective, you only flew an inch out of your way, but by the time it, it, you know, it manifested, you know, you're in Calcutta. Here's Jordan B. Peterson. Like, oh no, no, no. Like, see, the thing is, is like the, 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 uh, the Noah's flood. <laughs> Excuse me. No, it's flood, man. It's it's like a metaphor for, you know, like when things are really bad in your life, man. You just gotta drown that thing until it's dead, and then and then, you know, you'll emerge or whatever. You know, it's like, dude, it's yeah, it's a metaphor. It but it happened. It and if you don't want to believe that, then just go keep reading Pinocchio with Doctor Jordan B. Peterson. And keep solidifying in your mind that there is no truth, that it's all just some fancy tale to try to help you through life. And not a, a uh, what was that, what was that uh, Pantera album, uh, Vulgar Display of Power, right? Oh yeah, the flood didn't happen. It was, it's just a metaphor, man, but written by wise, 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 wise men who really knew how to write. It's just a metaphor though, man. Like don't get don't get all crazy. It's like, no, no, no. That was a vulgar display of power by God. And it broke his heart to do it. It says so. It says that it caused him to repent. That it, that he that he looked at what he did and he was just like, man, this went horribly wrong. Now I've got to kill all of these beautiful things that I made because they're wicked and disgust and they'll never be able to be turned. I got to kill them all. And then there came a point, and by the way, Noah, not a great guy. You know, you go back. This is a funny thing about reading the Bible, man. There's a lot of people that get thrown off. It's like those mechanical bulls. You know, that you see, maybe you see him in a bar, or maybe you've seen him on TV, and you think to yourself, like, oh, dude, I could totally do that. That bull's not really moving that fast. I don't understand why people fall off. And then you get on, and, like, two seconds into it, you're on the ground. You're like, whoa, how did that happen? That's what happens when, when Christians who don't read their Bible start reading. They start reading through Genesis, and they realize, like, I don't understand. I These people that I'm reading about, they're all awful I don't think I'm reading the actual Bible because I've never heard anything like this. Now that I'm reading it for myself, all of these people were horrible, horrible liars and drunks and rapists and just awful. You go through Genesis, man, and you're like, and you know, here's Noah, righteous Noah. Saved, he, he was rescued, he was spared because there was something about him that God said, all right, this guy's all right. And anyway, what that was, is it's not made clear to us, really, because you read about Noah's life and it's like, yeah, this guy, not great. Not great. And here's Noah and his wife, his three sons and their wives and all the animals. And the whole earth is covered in water. And the only remnant of humanity is now in this little tiny rubber ducky of a boat in the middle of the ocean. And God's just thinking to himself, you know what? I can end all of the pain right now. All I got to do is, all I got to do is push my finger on the port side of that boat and just flip it over and all the pain will be over and I can start all over again. I don't have to be hurt by these people anymore. I don't have to have it thrown in my face every day that free will when given to these creatures is always going to end up in me being broken hearted. All I got to do is just put, just tip that boat over and all the pain ends. That's all I got to do. You want to get into some metaphor, Dr. Peterson? Now, again, the things that are written in 12 Rules for Life, it, it's all good. And it's unoriginal, by the way. Tony Robbins has been saying the same thing for three decades now, or four. Before him, it was Zig Ziglar. Before him, it was somebody else. 
Those things in that book are not, that's why I'm saying like you should read that book and apply everything in it to your life. Because it's foundational wisdom. Clean your room, you idiot. Have an adventure. You will find yourself an adventure. There's something magical that happens when you risk. Be kind to animals. Let your kid ride a skateboard. Don't be an asshole. Whatever. Like these principles, they're not, you know, whatever. It's easy. It's basic. And everybody should do it. And it just so happens that the light was shined on Jordan B. Peterson enough so that he can retell the same thing that other men have been saying for decades and longer, thousands of years, in fact. There's nothing wrong in his book. There's, a, there's something wrong in his message is that he's going to the broken young men, and not just young men, but particularly it's the young men that he's affecting the worst, is that he's going to them and he's saying, sure, sure, Jesus is a wonderful metaphor. Sure, sure, 400 years of slavery and then God sends Moses and they're all taken away into the promised land 40 years later. It's a beautiful metaphor. You know what else is a beautiful metaphor? Pinocchio. Just an inch throwing you off, just an inch off course. Boop. Now you're lost. Now it's that much harder for you to come back and when you read these things, you're going to be like, is this just a metaphor or did this actually happen? Well, I don't think, I don't think the guy lived in the belly's whale. That's just a metaphor for man. You've got to save your father from the belly of the whale. Thanks, Jordan B. Peterson. He's demonic. He's steering people off. Maybe he's not demonic, but the strategy itself, well, I don't know. I don't know how that stuff actually works, but the message. It's not the truth. It's not the truth. You start speaking truth to power, you will be crucified. And any other, any other thing that happens, it's, it's got to make you wonder. It's like, are you telling the truth? You don't seem to be coming under any oppression. Your lack of oppression, your lack of, you know, actual you know, uh, violence on your life from other, from, from other people, violence that you don't deserve, your lack of that causes me to question. The fact that Joe Rogan keeps bringing you on back, Joe Rogan, and I'll still watch Joe Rogan, but he's, you know, he's, you know, he's, he has people on a show that I would like to hear from sometimes. But you want to you want to see the wishy washy, slimy, spineless nature of liars. It, it to have to live in the truth, all you need is a spine. And if you're not living in the truth, you are spineless. When you go to your work and you're like, yeah, I guess a woman has a right. You're spineless. You're a you're a uh, it, you're an invertebrate, a snake. You're a snake. Eat the dust, snake. You have to live on your belly. You have to bow your head to every living creature. You're a snake. Here's Joe Rogan. It's like, oh, so Dr. Jordan B. Peterson, like, uh, Christianity, man, how about it? He's like, oh, yeah, Christianity, man, it really changed the world. Like, it, you know, started this, it started that, and now we have free nations, and all that stuff comes from Christianity. And Joe Rogan's like, Oh, yeah, I guess you're right, man. I never really thought about it that way. And then some other guy will come on the show the very next day and be like, ah, Christians are retarded, man. They think God created everything. I believe that all of the somethings in the universe exploded from a big point of nothingness. Everything came from nothing, which is weird because scientific law has already proven that something cannot come from nothing, and yet this is the basis of my entire belief that Christians are stupid. <laughs> And Joe Rogan's like, yeah, Christians are stupid. Spineless. You got no spine, Joe Rogan. That's why you can't, that's why, you know, facts and, and opinions and, and, and thought and whatever escape you and they just drip through your hands like you're trying to grab the sand at the beach. It just empties through your hands. It's, you have no spine. Look, pick one. When Jordan B. Peterson is over there bastardizing it and 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 uh 
you know, blaspheming Christianity with his mealy mouth talk about Jesus Christ and the importance of Christianity in the world for the last 2,000 years. And you're like, oh, I never thought of it that way. And then the other guy comes on and you're like, haha, Christians are stupid. Hey, pick one. Pick one and you'll feel this weird sensation in your back. It's called a spine is forming. It doesn't matter which one you pick. Just pick one. And when Jordan Peterson sits across from you and starts talking about Christianity, ridicule him and say, ha ha, Christians are stupid, if that's what you decide. Or you can start thinking for yourself and start asking yourself, who was this Jesus guy? What did he do? Why is this important? Who was this guy? And find out for yourself. And then maybe you can sit across from Jordan B. Peterson and instead of jerking him off, and jerking off the next atheist who's going to sit across from you and sit there and make little your little funny j jokes that are old, by the way. Instead of doing that, maybe you can sit across the table and be like, you know what, Jordan Peterson, I don't appreciate your lack of spine when it comes to the topic of the most important man who ever lived. A man so important that we judge what day it is off of his life. Then you will have a spine. And then you will be crucified. And all your fancy friends will leave you. And then you will know the freedom. Then you will know the strength that God has for you. When you're standing alone and all of your friends have abandoned you, then you'll know who your real friends are. And it turns out it's, J it's John the Beloved. See how I tied that back in? I feel like there's some things I missed. Hey, if you want to support the show, go on to paypal.me slash archadvocate, paypal.me slash archadvocate, put a tip in the tip jar. Show costs me money. Uh, if you want to support it, please keep it going. Uh, and one of the most important things, yeah, of course I need money, but I need followers too. You know, I need people that are into the show. So share it. Tell your friends, man. These are dark times, man. It is the, it is, uh, I have dubbed it the Age of Shadows. We are living in the Age of Shadows, man. You better get real familiar with your Bible and get real familiar with your guns. Strange times ahead. That's the show for today. PayPal.me slash Thanks for the dough. Appreciate you guys. We'll talk to you tomorrow.